Well, welcome everyone to another episode of the Hector Mike Experience, Common Sense and Uncommon World. And in our world, we've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, we've got Supreme Court Justice has, that has now decided that he is going to retire. Uh, Justice Breyer, who is, I believe it's he's 82, and he does it. I, you know, look if you look at it, he does it in a in a great time, which is in January, which gives the Senate, gives a president plenty of time by which to nominate someone else, get him or her through the process. Um, unlike we've had in previous years, where you know they they did it so close to the election that it was kind of held over, and you know, we uh, we ended up seeing that uh, obviously the Democrats were quite upset as to who Donald Trump ended up uh, end up appointing there, but. Uh, but Mike, you know, it's it's uh, it's dominating the news as to who who is uh, Joe Biden going to pick. Joe Biden, you know, initially he said he was going to pick an African American woman. Um, this is when he first ran, and so now he's got that opportunity. Well, this this is uh, first of all just Justice Breyer, who's who is eighty two. <clears throat> if I ever make it to eighty two, I'd like to look as good as he does at eighty two because he certainly doesn't look it. Um, you know, he was one of those Republican appointees, I, I believe, of, of uh, um, 43, President Bush, uh, from New Hampshire, good friend, I think, of John Sununu, who was uh, Bush's chief of staff for a while, um, that really wasn't conservative, ended up being moderate and then moving to the left as time went on. I think the first thing we all have to acknowledge is that whoever the president picks, will most likely get the 50 votes necessary or 51 votes necessary um, to uh, to become Supreme Court justice. Um, they've got the votes and it doesn't require 60 votes to do it. And, you know, that's that's uh, you know, that's the way it should be. I mean, that's that's the way the process is. And it will, you know, undoubtedly, regardless of the color of the skin of the person, will be someone that's, you know, very left and, and very much in terms of um, court interpretation of the laws as opposed to following the laws. So that's just to be expected as we go forward. But the word I want to use with the selection of, of Justice Breyer's replacement, the way it is at least today, is a great word that we know in politics over and over at every level, and it's called patronage. You know, when you're running for office, you kind of do a deal with someone and say, hey, look, you give me your support and your people's support, you know, I'll put you on this board or I'll put you on this commission or I'll make sure your kid gets a job as, in the summer as a lifeguard. Not that I've had any experience with this stuff. Let me just be clear about this. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, you need your sidewalk fixed. We're going to take care of your sidewalk. So you got a tax problem, we'll take care of your tax problem. Um, you know, it's that kind of patronage thing. And this is what this is. Because, yes, it is going to be a black woman, which I think right there and then, you know, you start out with the equation of it doesn't matter whether the person is qualified, unqualified, whatever. Um, you know, Joe Biden has said it's going to be a black woman. And he said that not because he believed it, not because he believed that's what should happen, but because Congressman Jim Clyburn from South Carolina put his feet to the fire about it. And that's, and that's why, and we can go through that process, but that's why it's going to be a black woman. Um, and it's, it really is because of patronage. He needed Clyburn's endorsement in South Carolina. Remember, in, in January of 2020, Joe Biden, the presumptive Democrat nominee, front runner, finished fourth, I think it was, in Iowa. Um, then goes to New Hampshire and finishes fifth in New Hampshire. So the first two primaries, the presumptive front runner has finished fourth and fifth. He needed to win South Carolina. And so to do that, he went to the person that's, you know, arguably the political kingmaker for the Democrats in that state, and that's Clyburn, who said to him, you know, you have to promise me you're going to appoint a, an African-American woman as Supreme Court justice before I endorse you. And he did. And, and during a debate. And then the next day after he made that promise, Clyburn appears on stage and endorses him. So that's how we're going to get an African-American woman on the Supreme Court. And I'll leave it up to people to decide if that's the best way you should be picking Supreme Court justices or their qualifications because you made a, a political promise to it. But that's the reality of it. Well, he's got a, he's got a couple. There's, there's one of them that's uh, being discussed right now. 
and she, uh, uh, Justice Kruger from the California uh, State Supreme Court. I think that um, you know what, at least from what I haven't, I haven't read um, all the details on her, but what I have had read is that she is a uh, Jerry Brown appointee. That um, she is not just a Jerry Brown appointee, but she's also. You should answer that. That could be him calling you. I, it, it, uh, <laughs> it, 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 funny thing, it, it is. It is not him. I, it, oh, it's, okay. It's a friend of ours, uh, Micah, calling me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I'd, if it was, I, I, I get, I, I have a robe from somebody's closet judge in Rhode Island that I took once. So you know, it's still, <laughs> still hanging there. You can use it. Yeah. Well, the thing is that even, even with Kruger. Um, you know, at least what, what I've been reading is that she's somewhat of a um, conservative in, you know, according to Democrat, you know, Democrat um, lines in the way she, she looks at her, her cases, which I think, you know, one of the one of the interesting parts is going to be everyone's going to start dissecting who his potential nominees are to see whether they're they're liberal or whether they're conservative. And, you know, and I think that, you know, you right now with the Senate being so close with, you know, 50 votes, mm -hmm. plus the vice president being able to break, do the tiebreaker, that the, the you're going to have the, the woke left is going to want their woke justice. And, um, and at the same time, you know, so I, I, so I, I, I see it, he's going to get the votes. Um, but I just don't know how far left he can go or how wokeness he can go with, with his nomination. Now, he's got to get something through because he's got to show some sort of at least win because over the last several weeks i mean he is he has been faltering in in, a, in his plan and now you've got russia that's got a hundred thousand troops you know on the border of ukraine you've got um you know you've got the economy with inflation that's still a problem we've got the um supply chain being a problem itself and so you know he's he's got to get some sort of win i think you know one of the things that if he wants to kind of resurrect his his election or his presidency Maybe he nominates Kamala Harris and gets her out of being VP. And so this way, you know, he can go find a VP who's a little bit more competent and can actually help out this administration as opposed to give him more problems. Well, <laughs> what is that? I'll, I'll give you my second round pick if you give me your seventh, eighth and third round pick and, and a player to be named later. Yes. Um, I, I, I don't see that happening. Um, I, I don't think it's actually I don't think it's a bad idea, um, you know, but I don't see that happening. I think that would be such a throwing in the towel. I, I do think that if if he did nominate Kamala Harris to be the Supreme Court judge, you'd probably get some Republicans uh, in the in the 50 Republicans supporting uh, supporting that move because because they, they'd want her out. Um, you'd probably get a whole bunch of Democrats supporting that move, but I don't think he, I don't think he would do that. And I don't think, and to answer your first point, I think he's going to go as left as he needs to go. Uh, he's, this is, a, you know, in this, in the betting world, this is a, a, a five-star lock. I mean, unless he picks someone that self implodes that, um, you know, has such things that, you know, you just can't imagine. Um, he's going to get the 50 plus one that he needs. I don't see any Democrat breaking on this. I don't see Manchin breaking on this. I don't see Cinema breaking on this. I don't see any Democrat breaking on this. If if he picks someone that has credentials and has um, stature and has a record um, and qualifications, I can see him picking up a half dozen Republican votes. Um, I totally can see that. Uh, because, you know, Republicans, I think, will, um, there are some Republicans there that will, um, uh, that will move, you know, move in, in that favor. Um, so that's, that's kind of where I see all of that. I, I don't think he, he's going to go as far left as he wants because he can, and he needs it, and he needs to get past some of the failures that he's had. And, you know, usually a Supreme Court win is a Supreme Court justice thing is a good win. Um, what's interesting is, is uh, Congressman Clyburn, again, you go back to the source of where all of this is coming from, you know, has, has uh, put out a name of Michelle Childs, who's a judge down in South Carolina, the black woman, um, you know, that, that he feels is qualified. I think there's a woman, a black woman who's on the D.C. District Court 
U.S. District Court um, that has a, um, a lot of uh, support. Um, you know, but but again, I mean, it's interesting because because usually it's a philosophical question as to who the Supreme Court justice is based on who the president is, and you know we've be, we've come to a place now where this whole equity thing, you know, we have to check a box more importantly than making a decision about who would be the best person. You know, we got to check a box to make sure we've got this covered because. You know, at some point in time, back in probably February, early February of 2020, Joe Biden cut a deal with with uh, James Clyburn to make sure that a black judge would be on the court if he became president. And, you know, so now it's time to pay the piper. Well, I want to get to your check in the box. But first of all, you know, my one of my reasons for Kamala is she's going to Honduras in the next couple of days. And, she, you know, and, and in her reason why she's going to Honduras is to talk about the reasons for migration. It's like, didn't you already have that trip, you know, to another place <laughs> as to why people migrate into, go, come to the United States? And so- That's interesting. You know, I, so I, I, maybe she gets frequent flyer points or something, I don't know. I know she said she wanted to get out of Washington. That was her mantra last year. Right. You know, they did the year end interview. I gotta get out of Washington. I gotta get out of Washington. I, I didn't know it was to go to, you know, other places outside the United States, but. It's just going to Honduras. Why not go to Middle America and find out what you know what is happening there? What all the supply chain is impacting businesses, not just agriculture, but you know all, all these other all these other you know mom and pop shops. And so, um, yeah. So we'll we'll find out what what disaster she ends up creating there in Honduras. <laughs> That's an optimistic view. <laughs> hey, we don't have any issues right now in Honduras. Let's send Kamala down and see if we can drum some up. <laughs> It's a great policy thing, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but but you know what what she said, um, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, stick to the plan. I mean, that's that's usually what you do in in any kind of strategic operation. You develop a plan, you stick to it. Getting out of D.C. is not a bad idea, because you, you know, I mean, having been there for a few years, and you can you know that it is a bubble. It's definitely a bubble, and and when you're in the level that she's at, it's it's really a bubble. So getting out is a, is really quite a good idea, but you know, like you said, get out to America, not you know to to Honduras or someplace else, because you know all it does is when you say that, the first thing that it conjures up is her past trips out of the country that have been problems. So you know, strategically, why you would why you would do that, and and just reinforce or, or um, remind people. Of, of that I don't I don't quite understand that but yeah and, then again, and to go, yeah to go back a little bit on your check the box I mean we see this all in society I mean look at every look at your when you're watching TV every commercial you know it's like okay do we have this ethnicity do we have that ethnicity do we have this gen do we have this sexual orientation it's, it's all become a box I mean you know we're gonna see it's like okay do we have the left-handed albino from albania you know that's you know, that's gonna be the new box that someone's got to check off and and it's and it's in, it's it's it takes i think it takes away from the um the selection process it also takes away you know i think for for a lot of folks is you know am i getting selected you know and, and I, i'll say it as a minority is do i get selected because of the color of my skin or do i get selected because i beat out everyone else and what does it say about the hard work or what does it say about the struggle that I've had to go through in order to get to where I'm at. Right. Does it diminish some of that? Yes. And go ahead. I think it no, does. It does. I mean, and it's unfortunate. And, you know, in your case, it's, I don't think it's because you're in a minority. It's because you're so good looking, Hector. You're so good looking. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're absolutely right. And I think what it does is, you know, it, it used to be the Democrats were, and, and this is, public perception, and I've seen polling on this recently, Democrats used to be equated with equality, okay? Everybody gets a fair shot. Um, you know, whether that was right or wrong, that's kind of the perception of, of, of Democrats. Now it's equity, which is we've got to, you know, check the box and make sure that we write whatever was done wrong before. And that, I think, is what does turn people off because it, it you know, it doesn't go to the, you know, to, to their qualifications or their character or their integrity. It goes to 
how they look or who they are. Um, and I think any time you reach that point, I think people are kind of getting fed up with it. Um, but, you know, I mean, again, what this <laughs> what this is, is and, and, and having grown up, you know, working in city halls and stuff like that, you know, you see what the patronage system is. You know, this is the ultimate patronage act. Um, you know, basically, I needed Mr. Clyburn's support. I needed that black vote in South Carolina. I couldn't take another second or third place or fourth or fifth place hit. So I cut my deal. And now the chickens come home to roost. You know, it's uh, it's politics at its uh, at, at its most base, really, for the highest, um, you know, highest office in the, you know, one of the, the most important positions in the land. Yeah, and you're so, so true. Well, Mike, I wanted to uh, change gears a little bit, and I wanted, you know, wanted to have this discussion as to, you know, what a, a new ordinance that is happening here in California. It's in the city of San Jose, the mayor's office, um, and along with the city council. Well, the city council just passed a, an ordinance that requires that if you are a owner of firearm that you must register that firearm in the sense of you've got to you've got to pay liability insurance. Mm-hmm. In addition, you've got to um, they're going to charge you some fees, which are going to go to some nonprofit in order for them to create what they call an initiative to try to stem gun violence and um, and gun harm that is happening in the city of San Jose. And you know, and and as they were they were debating all this, they were debating this this ordinance. They talked about how many people, you know, are killed each year by you know gun through with the use of a firearm and throughout the United States and so forth. And I just it seems so backwards where you're going to now impose another fee, another barrier for individuals to be able to go and legally own a firearm. The word is. Remember that? Well, you're too young for this. I remember the password show. You know, what's the password? The password is ass backwards. That's the password. They can't figure out what to do with the criminals who have guns, who, you know, guns aren't registered, guns aren't licensed, their guns aren't, you know, bought on the black market, they're ghost guns. They can't figure out how to stop that. Um, So they throw up their hands and say, well, let's go after the people that do have guns and do have them legally, do have them registered. I mean, you know, the classes that you have to take in order to be able to get a gun, the background check you have to pass in order to get a gun. Some of the strictest laws in the country are here in California to get a gun. The ability to gain ammunition in California is absolutely ridiculous. You can't get it, except, of course, if you're a criminal. You know, I, I mean, I that's the part that doesn't make any sense is, you know, you got to th- go through all these hoops to first get a gun and get it registered. And then you've got to go through all these hoops to get ammunition, which is very difficult to get. Um, yet somehow the criminals don't seem to have any problem getting it. And so what this says is, OK, we can't figure out how to stop the criminals. So, we'll, you know, we'll figure to do something that's window dressing and apply it to people who are law abiding citizens. Um, and it's a, to me, it's a PR stunt. And it's disappointing to see that because... Uh, and by the way, it's probably going to never see the light of day in terms of enactment because of the constitutionality of it. But, you know, again, it's like, um, you know, you, you want to make a big statement or something. How about making a big statement that says, you know, when you arrest someone who's been convicted of three previous gun violent possessions, they don't get bail. They go to jail until their court date shows up or they or you know, they don't, um, they just automatically walk, you know, I mean, those kinds of things where, and I've seen it, I mean, I, you know, I talked to people, you know, someone was telling me last week about the situation where, you know, someone committed a crime with a gun, and then a week later, they were back, you know, and they were like two or three previous strikes, and then a week later, they were back on the street, and they did it again, and, you know, address that as opposed to address the people that go through the classes, you know, go through all of the proper procedures, do the licensing, do the background check. The other thing that, that you know, when you look at the story about this is that there are so many open-ended questions that, that the city can't answer. Um, who's the nonprofit? while well, they're putting it together. How much are they going to be able to make? You know, estimates are upwards of a million dollars. Who's going to determine how that money is spent to be determined? 
they want you to make sure that you have an insurance policy added to your homeowner's insurance or something like that. Well, what is that going to cost you? What's the minimum that you have to have? What's the liability on it that you're going to be covered for? They don't have answers to that question. So, you know, to me, it's it's all about show and, and nothing about substance that's going to protect anybody that's a law-abiding citizen. Well, and here's Which is, the thing, by the way, what, the, what they should be doing because that's right, what they're well, elected to do. Well, and here's the thing is, let's say, let's say I've got a firearm and I shoot an intruder. Well, is the, I'm, I'm wondering if it's oft, oftentimes the insurance would rather just, you know, would just rather settle the case right. than, than, than go through all the, you know, the years of court, of court cases. And so, so I shoot an intruder. Does that family then have the ability to sue me? Mm-hmm. And and for the insurance itself, right? You know, yeah, and, the, and, and you're and, right. The insurance company, yeah. right? I mean, insurance companies are in the business of, you know, mitigating their losses. So you know, if if I can, you know, in this case, you know, someone breaks into your house and you shoot them, um, and you know, they decide to sue the insurance company, your homeowner's insurance, if it's on your homeowner's policy, um, you know, they'll they're likely to settle. So it makes. It really makes no sense, and and that's the thing that's so frustrating about it, is that it's it's endemic of what we have here in California, and again, I think it's important to note it's not this way everywhere, but it's endemic of what we have here in California, which is we have the strongest gun laws in the country, but we still have problems with violent crime, and and none of the actions that are taken by district attorneys by city, you know, legis- city councils, by mayors, by the state legislature. None of that addresses the issue. It, it addresses other things that, um, you know, they, it, it really is as backwards. We can't figure out how to stop the people who, are, who have the guns illegally. So let's punish the people that have them legally. Well, um, and, and in, our, in our previous discussion, we, we, talk, we talk about it, and it's important to, to remind folks is, over the last six, seven years, there's been all this legislation, there's been all these law changes where we've reduced violent felonies down to felonies, we've reduced felonies down to misdemeanors. And so the consequences have been taken away. So for example, if someone breaks into a place and steals a gun, as long as it's under $950, that gun, it's considered a misdemeanor, right. like a fix a ticket. Right. And so if you want to stem you know, um, gun violence, why not make any theft of a, of a firearm a felony or a violent felony? Right. But, they're, but they don't, they're not going to do that because Republicans and other legislators have tried. There's been some Democrats who have been, you know, who, who understand, who, one of them, for example, uh, Jim Cooper, somebody named Jim Cooper, who worked, as, worked in the sh- sheriff's department. He worked in the jails, and, and he's tried to make some of these laws along with Republicans say, okay, theft of a firearm should be a felony. He's also trying to make it where, and this is, you know, I know we're repeating ourselves as we've done in the past, but it's important to note that, you know, the rape of an unconscious woman or person, even though even though the perpetrator is the one who gave him the rape, date rape drug, that's no longer a violent felony. Mm. Human trafficking of minors is no longer a violent felony. And so when you take away the consequences, when you take away the punishment, you're going to get folks that feel emboldened to go do other things. And you get that in California with all this, you know, crimes. You get this in New York, too, where, they, where they've had, you know, zero bail. And now they're kind of trying to unwind some of that. We've got, you know, district attorneys here who want zero bail and have said, you know what, we're not going to go out and prosecute misdemeanors. Right. And so when you when you basically tell tell the public, hey, if you commit a misdemeanor, we're not going to prosecute it or take or, you know, or, or, or carry it forward. Well, if I can go to store still under nine hundred fifty bucks, as long as I'm good, then it doesn't get prosecuted by the district attorney, and all those things just just add up to what we've got right now, which is the the criminals running the system. I mean, it really is. It's the criminals running the system, and I think an insurance policy is not a you know having an insurance policy, an extra insurance policy. I I'm, I think that's a fairly good idea. I mean, I would like an extra insurance policy um, against the actions of George Gascon yeah. and, the, and the danger that it presents to my family, to my property, to myself, because of the way he, he is, you know, opened the door for criminals, the revolving door. 
Um, you know, I think we should have insurance policies against, you know, people uh, up in the Bay Area that, you know, allow people to go do whatever the hell they want and have no consequence to it at all. I think we should have insurance policies, you know, um, the, the small businesses that get looted and robbed. I saw one the other day in Southgate, you know, these, these, uh, these people uh, running through the store at a, a, a makeup Ultra. store, yeah, Ultra, Ultra. Yeah. Um, you know, that, uh, that, you know, just going through scooping stuff out. I mean, you know, and, and running out um, and nothing happens. I mean, you know, they had the smash and grabs in LA, 14 people arrested, 14 people, all of them released. Uh, you know, I mean, that's what we need insurance from. We need insurance from these district attorneys like Gascon. We need insurance from people like Hertzberg and in the assembly and in the Senate and those people up in Sacramento to, to you know, protect us from harm and damage that their policies are doing and putting us at risk because it does put us at risk. And there's no doubt about it. When you have someone that's convicted two or three times on a gun possession, gets arrested, has another gun possession, and then is out on the street and arrested a week later for a gun possession, guess what? They don't have, that gun's not registered. They're not following any rules or regulations, but they're still on the street and still doing what they're doing. That's what we need insurance from, not from people that, um, you know, go through the process, fill out all the paperwork, do all of the proper training and techniques that you need to do, um, and, you know, store your weapon correctly and use it correctly. We don't need protection from those folks. We need protection from those folks that are doing it illegally. And if they can't figure it out, then maybe we need an insurance policy to protect ourselves from these incompetent people. And I, and I think that's what we do. That's probably we where it's it's a it's funny it, you know saying it, but but it's but it's the honest truth is that insurance policy, as you noted, against you know these people who really put 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 criminals first, you know, instead of the victims. Yeah, I mean, I mean we can't we can't get in California. And this is and this is just goes back to the absurdity. In the state legislature, there have been there they have tried you know some some members have tried to make fentanyl. A classified as a controlled substance or, or um, dangerous uh, uh, drug, mm -hmm. you know, and they can't get it. They, there's there has been a move for like all these porch pirates. You know, we saw the trains mm -hmm. in um, the Southern Pacific um, Railroad and all those packages that had been you know robbed. And so there was there was legislation. It was introduced that said, let's treat packages that come in from private companies like Amazon. Let's treat them. And give them the same classification as we would like mail coming in from the United States Post Office. Right. If you steal mail coming in through the Federal United States crime. Post Office, it is a felony. Right. But they said, okay, let's give it the same classification. You know, if, if you get a package coming in from from Amazon or some other uh, some other private company, let's also create it a felony. It's like, oh no, we can't do that. Um, they even tried to introduce legislation. It's called on um, porch pirates, where it said, if the person is caught more than three times stealing packages from someone's home now mind you, you got to catch them three times if they're caught and charged three more than three times that that would now be considered automatic felony that was too difficult to do <laughs> and so it's just you know it and, it and it didn't go anywhere because at the end of the day they would rather do a pr stunt like what they're mm -hmm. doing in san jose than actually get things accomplished and actually do things because you know, at the end of the day, is I I don't know what constituency that is that the criminals have, or what message these criminals have that are sitting in jail saying, hey, you know what? Now I've got a great lobbyist, I've got a you know they've got a great supporter of someone in Sacramento at the expense of of, of the crime victims, at the expense of our community, and expensive, you know, of us being able to walk out of our homes and feel safe. So I, it's it's a, it, it's crazy. Well, it's it's this is how crazy it is. It makes you long for the good old days when the people up in the legislature, especially on the Democrat side of the aisle, were just the puppets of the labor unions, the public labor unions. Um, you know, that was compared to where we are now, that was much better than being uh, the puppets for criminals that that are, you know, roaming the streets and com committing these crimes. There should also be a law against stupidity. I mean, you know, and, and um, maybe that's how we have turnover because if you can't get a, a 
a bill passed that says if you're convicted or arrested three times, convicted three times of stealing a package, it's now a felony. Um, you know, it, it just, what it says is they're not interested in it. They, they, you know, there's a conscious decision being made because nobody's that stupid, even here. Uh, there's a conscious decision being made that we don't want to deal with this stuff, whether it's because we don't want to put somebody in jail or whatever reason it is. Um, and what it does is it, it makes for an unsafe environment where, you know, people are afraid to go out. People have their property stolen. You know, people are in the wrong place at the wrong time. People, you know, are running around with, you know, weapons that, um, you know, have nothing to do with people that legally own guns. Um, and, you know, we've got a, um, a, a, a legislative body that allows that to happen. And we've got people at the law enforcement level that don't think it's a big deal. And, you know, that's why we have, you know, I saw Gavin Newsom trying to figure out standing on the railroad tracks, you know, who's doing all of this stuff. It's like, dude, look at the video. I mean, it's the people that your policies and your party's policies are, are allowing to be on the street to rob trains every day, you know, eight or nine times a day. So, you know, you, you in a way, they say you get what you pay for, you get what you vote for. Yeah, Same well, thing. And, and the hypocrisy there is, sure, he goes there, does a press conference, spends 20 minutes collecting the trash, and then goes back into his, um, his state vehicle where he's got, you know, he's protected by the California Highway Patrol. He's all safe and everything, goes back home and says, all right, guys, you guys deal with the rest. If he really right. wanted and cared about it, he would have gone out there and say, this is how we're changing the laws. This is how we're increasing the penalties. This is how we're going to make it, you know, if you if you do the crime, you're going to do the time. But he's actually been one of the lead advocates for early release. And the thing is, and, and it's important for people to realize is, when you take, like, the human trafficking of children, when you take it from a violent felony and you declassify it and make it a lower penalty, what you now have done is you have now triggered and allowed those people who commit the crime to get out of jail sooner. Mm -hmm. They are able to accumulate good time and time spent there at a quicker rate. Right. And so so for all these like violent felonies that we would classify violent felonies or that were classified that have now made, you know, de un taken away from violent felonies, these people, these criminals, they get out of jail faster. Mm -hmm. They do. And they're back on the street and they're doing the same thing. Right. I mean, that's, that's you know, that that's the crazy part. That's the, uh, you know, the, the stupidity part of all of it um, is that they're back out doing the same thing and there's no reason for them not to. Um, you know, it just, and, and you're right. It's, you know, what he did was a, an elaborate PR stunt. And by the way, why did you have to see it on national news to know that it's an issue? You know, I mean, people around the country are laughing at California because they're looking at it and shaking their heads and saying, what's wrong with those people? You know, I mean, they, they got train robberies like in the 1800s. I mean, you know, you've got all these things littered on the tracks and suddenly the governor realizes it. I mean, how do you not know that? And, and you know, you go down and you clean it up. Oh, whoop de doo And like you said, you go back, you know, then you go back up and you go back to the policies that allow the people to have the opportunity and no consequence for what it is that, that's going on there. And then you've got Gascon who says to the, to the train company, hey, this is your responsibility. That's the other part. It's like, it's your responsibility to police this area. And, and you know, it's like, well, wait a minute. They are policing the area. The problem is when they arrest people, you put them back out on the street. So, you know, it, it's what it is, is, is something that, you know, again, I put it this way. You get what you pay for, you get what you vote for. And that's, yeah. you know, that's what we've got. So, um, you know, if you, want a, if you want a different result, maybe you, start, you ought to start looking at uh, different people that have more common sense than what we have now that actually would look and say, you know, you know, giving a woman a date rape drug and then raping her is a violent crime. How anyone, I don't care if you're right, left, middle, Republican, Democrat, independent, green, purple, whatever. I don't understand how that is not a common sense issue. You know, the trafficking, human trafficking of minors, how that's not a violent issue. You know, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And that's why we're in, 
not only an uncommon world, but at the center of it in uncommon California. Yeah. Well, let's. Uh, I'd, I'd love to end it a little bit happier note than, with, than this old. Well, let's, note. let's end it on a happier note, which is that I think based on this discussion, the first discussion, and the second discussion about about crime and and what needs to be done, I think both of us would look pretty good in black robes. No, oh, I think we would. Be. I could get another one, you know. I got I got a yeah. tailor back in Rhode Island that can take care of that. So, make so what you a judge? <laughs> so, what's your what's your what's your take on the football games this weekend? Uh, I think the Rams are, are, are the Rams are for real. Okay. Um, and uh, and I think Kansas City is just a machine. Yeah. Um, and I'm very sad because I do believe that Tom Brady is going to hang him up this year. Oh, do you really? Um, yeah, I do think he's going to do that. I think the family is going to weigh in on this, and and that will be a sad thing. But you know, I'm marking my calendar from the day he announces his retirement to to be in Canton, Ohio, because um, that's what I want to go see. Well, and um, so you got Roethlisberger that just resigned, that just yep. uh, stepped down yep. today, actually. Yeah. Or was I? Yeah, I believe it yeah, was today. today. Yeah. yeah, today. You know, and you got the, ex- the Breyer announcement, and then you got Roethlisberger. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he'd look good in a black robe too. I mean, you yeah. know, <laughs> Tom Brady would not look good in a black robe. He's he's going to be too busy making money with his clothing line and his you know TV twelve and everything else. He's really done an amazing job of of putting together, um, you know, and, and you read his some of his stuff, and it's fascinating because. It really is a, um, and I know there's not a lot of Tom Brady fans out there, especially here on the left coast, but you read, you know, how he approaches things and, uh, you know, just in terms of not wasting time, focusing on things in a positive way, you know, keeping things in perspective. There's a lot of leadership lessons on some of the things that he does that, that apply across the board. So what is what happens to Gronk? Oh, because I think... Does he, I, I, yeah, does he, does I think he hang him up too? With, yeah, with I, th- the... I think I think if Brady goes, Gronk goes too. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, I, he took a couple of wicked hits yeah. uh, in that game against the Rams, and you know, I, I having watched him for so long, you know, you see those hits and you know how how bad they probably hurt because he's been hurt before. You know, he he's another one that goes on and and I think just enjoys life. I don't think there's a better example of someone that enjoys <laughs> life than Gronk. <laughs> Well, uh, we'll see. We'll see what this uh, weekend. Yeah, weekend Rams, shows up. I'm and, telling you, man. I think the Rams are gonna. I, the Rams are for real. That's what. That's what I saw. I mean, okay. you know, and it's tough. It's tough to beat a division opponent three times in one year, and that's yeah. what they. That's what would have have to happen for San Francisco to win. And uh, I just think, you know, what I saw on on Sunday was, you know, it wasn't necessarily they collapsed at the end. They just, you know, that's Tom Brady. He he knows how to find a way to win. Um, but, you know, instead of like hunkering down, they came back, Stafford made a couple of big plays. Um, you know, that was impressive. Well, and, and then you've got the Super Bowl back in, uh, back, back in, in Los SoFi. Angeles. Yep. Yeah. Back in SoFi, back in Los yep. Angeles, which, uh, you know, you're going to, you know, tickets all... started 6250. <laughs> seriously? Wow. Yeah, that's what I, it was funny because I did look to see, um, uh, how much it was to get, you know, I went to, to one of the ticket master things to get seats behind the Rams bench this Sunday was probably in the 20, well, this is earlier in the week, the 24 to $2,600 range. In Kansas City, it was around 1250 to 1400 um, You know, and then I checked up at uh, Gillette Stadium and it's 35 cents to get a ticket on Sunday <laughs> where it's going to have 12 inches of snow to sit behind the bench. So I might do that because that's more in my budget. Yeah. But it was interesting. It, it literally is double uh, at SoFi than it, than it is in Kansas City. So, yeah. you know, it'll be fun. Yeah, I think I think it will be fun. So, Mike, until uh, until we do this again, All right, I'm, off, I'm off for the I'm out for the weekend. i um, going to go enjoy my time over in uh, beautiful Las Vegas. So I'm out. Oh, good for you. Yeah. Good for you. Have fun. All right, we'll do. All right, take care, everybody.